When farmers change to no-till, very few escape the almost inevitable teething problems. Which is why if someone comes around promising you moonlight or roses, I'd think twice. El Miron has had his share of concerns and mishaps with residue in his first years of no-till. Well, when I first uh, started no-tilling, uh, I was concerned about the residue. And I had an older planter, it was a John Deere 7000. And on my third year of no-tilling, I had my first year I had planted corn into a uh, sod field. On the second year, beans went into the corn stalks. And on the third year, I came back into corn. And the residue was plugging up the planter. I, it would not move through the planter very easily. And quite often I had to get out and, and unplug the planter and, and uh, I had a residue problem. I've never had a problem since then. So how did he resolve his problems with residue? I guess he had some fancy equipment, right? Nope, but Al has a PhD in ruminant nutrition and this gave him a unique insight into his soils. And it's because of these rumen bacteria that are growing and, and the soil is more biologically active and they're breaking down that residue very quickly. We're looking at a bean field right here that last year was in corn. This corn made 200, a little over 211 bushels to the acre. I don't feel that I have enough residue. And we can look at that and you can see that the residue is rather limited because the soil biology is breaking down that residue. Got it. So knowledge of a living soil was like Al's superpower that helped him realize that residue wasn't going to overwhelm his operation? Exactly. And I suspect this knowledge was a big factor that kept him in no-till when the going got tough and maybe when his neighbors were disavowing the practice. Okay, so Al is definitely East River, but he's only one example. Are there more examples? Of course. Our next video on residue will take us down to Clay County. Join us for another insight into residue.